Welcome to episode number 287, where I'm speaking with Dr. Baswati Bhattacharya about an article she wrote titled Better Living Beyond Chemistry. We talk about the reductionist approach of modern medicine, the need to integrate prana and nature into modern medicine, and how medicine is a reflection of our spiritual vibrations. So please stay tuned. Hi there, I'm your host Colette, and on this podcast I will be sharing the teachings of Ayurveda, yoga, and holistic health practices. Now if you're new to Ayurveda, I recommend checking out the first couple of episodes where I do an introduction to Ayurveda and the mind-body types. Thanks for listening, and now here is a new episode. Hello and welcome back to the Elements of Ayurveda podcast. I am very happy to welcome back Baswati Bhattacharya, who is a licensed board certified physician scientist and Fulbright scholar with a focus on the wisdom and science of authentic medicines such as Ayurveda. She serves as clinical assistant professor in the Department of Medicine at Cornell Medical College in New York, founder director of the Dinacharya Institute, and as chief science and research officer of Veda Farms. She has worked in organizations related to Ayurveda for over two decades. Bhattacharya has degrees in neuroscience, a BA from UPenn, pharmacology, MA from Columbia, public health, MPH from Harvard, MD from Rush University of Chicago, family medicine from Columbia, community medicine from Mount Sinai, NYU, and a PhD in Ayurveda from Banaras Hindu University, specializing in Rasa Shastra, ancient Indian chemistry, Ayurvedic pharmaceutics, and pharmacology. She is the author of national bestseller published by Penguin, Everyday Ayurveda, and her work has been featured in the Discovery Channel documentary, Healers, Journey into Ayurveda. Welcome back to the podcast, Dr. Baswati. It's a pleasure to chat with you again. Thank you, and thank you for having me again. Bonjour. Bonjour. And I would love to talk about a recent article I came across of yours. I think it was published in February, but it was titled Better Living Beyond Chemistry. And I thought it was so great. I wanted to have a longer discussion on it. And if you would allow me, I'd like to summarize the article a little bit and please correct me if I'm, if I'm wrong. But essentially it was about modern science having a reductionist approach to medicine, looking through the lens of chemistry and what it's missing out on and the important and crucial view of the holistic view and the systems-based approach to medicine, which Ayurveda has. Is that a a good synopsis? Yeah, yes. Okay, great. Um, First of all, I'd like to talk about this reductionist approach of modern sciences and this looking through the lens of chemistry. And you mentioned in pharmaceuticals, nutrition, even in the modern day supplements world. Uh, Could you talk a little bit further about that, please? Yeah. So when we look at pre-med courses, we look at biology, chemistry, physics, And then there's a year of mathematics and a year of English that are required. And they really believe that um, biology, chemistry, and physics are real sciences. At the same time, a lot of the principles of chemistry that we see in amazing chemical applications, such as material sciences, nanotechnology, and chemistry down at the real cellular level, um, what we call quaternary structures. So fourth degree structures of chemistry that are not what we find in the laboratory, but what we find in the real world. Even if you look at that chemistry or you look at biology and many of the instinctive things that birds do or dolphins do, or even dogs and our own pets, our cats or our, you know, whatever other pets we have, we see that they are biologically and in according to biological science, they are doing things that we don't have any explanation for, but we accept them. Physics, same thing. There's a lot of uh, new stuff come out and coming out in the last couple of decades around how our universe 
is and whether black holes exist and the force of gravity and how any two objects, whether it's a small atom or a big planet, does have effects on us. And the entanglement theory, string theory, and various field applications um, where Things that move are not just according to a molecule, but they move in according to a holistic system that's a field of uh, a large, uh, we can call it a fractal. There's an entire field called fractal physiology that looks at how things move in masses and not uh, specifically in that reductionistic way that you were saying. And yet, when we look at the data that modern doctors um are, I have to say, dogmatic towards that they accept as real science because they're not accepting those other things I talked about. What they will look at is nutrition studies that are done on people using randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled trials, saying that is the way, that is the gold standard. And when you have many of them together and you average them out through a meta-analysis, that's considered superior statistical medicine which I find to be really amazing because they're ignoring so much of the data. And then on the other side, they do rat studies and studies on cell cultures that do not have any holistic way of being with an entire organism. And they use those data as absolute, um, what shall we say, believable you know, data. So nutritionists are famous for having a study that works and shows that something is good for you, one day and then six months later, that same exact thing is bad for you. We've seen it with milk. We've seen it with coffee. We've seen it with um, red wine. We've seen it with tomatoes and with, you know, various fruits. This fruit is very, very bad for you. Don't have it. It's very bad. And then six months later, an article says it's very good. And the very interesting thing is that we have a whole uh, group of what we'll call ancillary, they call they say they're part of the healthcare system, but they're doing health news. And their job is to get anything that's just on the verge of being published in a journal and writing a press release on it and taking that that group of doctors and making them famous on large um, news channels to say, this study just came out in this very leading journal and look at it. And if you look at the way that they claim things, those of us who know how to read articles will go to the primary published article in some very nice journal. And it's, uh, you know, the ones that really piss me off, I'll say. One will be a study on a cell line that is some transformed, which means it's been artificially made cancerous, transformed cell line, which means it will keep replicating. And they will assume that that cancerous artificially um, uh, transformed cell line is going to have the same properties of the organ from which they took the cells and they're going to do some experiment on it and it'll, you know, put out some chemical and they say, see, this chemical came out and see the cancer cells grew less by 30%. Oh, this is the next cure for cancer. And it really pisses me off because those cells were artificially treated. They have not really a lot of similarity. I mean, there are some similarities, but obviously that's how they publish, but it doesn't work. The second is they'll do a study and say, we have found a chemical or a pathway. And you go and read the article and it's on some mouse or some fruit fly or some rat. And I know you're smiling right now, Colette, but these are the kinds of studies. And then the third one that really pisses me off is they'll do some computer modeling of what they think a structure of an enzyme or a protein or a uh, cell membrane looks like and they'll stick a chemicals structure on it and they'll do computer modeling of where it fits and then they will come up with putative means um, proposed uh, interactions between part a which is let's say the drug and part b which is the receptor for the drug and by doing these artificial things that has nothing really to do with what happens in the human but these people that write these press releases will make it seem like something really big has happened. And then you get the people that watch those particular, you know, science watch, news watch, uh, medicine watch, whatever they're called. And they will tell everyone. And now, of course, we know WhatsApp is the latest thing to, you know, be the propagator of fake news. And people will send out 
all kinds of stuff. And it propagates that reductionistic model in a funny way because they're trying to say that their little experiment really means that it it applies on a huge, um, we can say, organismic or a population level. See, here's the next cure for diabetes, for cancer, for heart disease, for whichever, you know, Alzheimer's. And when it draws out, when they say, well, okay, so when are you going to prove that it works in humans? They'll say, you know, we need more funding for research. That is like the, you know, the, the last sentence of the study. And meanwhile, you have people that have been using medicines for millennia, and they know the nuances of how to um, alter them or or titrate them according to particular factors. We've talked about Dasha Vida Pariksha, so 10 different factors. Um, I can uh, name them th- according to a shloka, which is in the Ashtanga Hridayam chapter 12, Shoka 67, 68, and it says, Desham dushyam balam kalam anala prakriti vaya sattva satmiya ahara avastha. And it is the state of being of where you are. If you're in a different climate, like you're in France right now and I'm in Benares, it's going to have a very different effect than both of us li- living or moving um, in uh, to New York. And the fact that your climate has um, something to do is not acknowledged in modern medicine. They say, oh, isn't it interesting that the people in Norway showed such a different effect of this particular drug than people in uh, Mexico City? And in Ayurveda, of course they did. And it really has to do with something very simple and um, I don't want to call it scientific, but it is science-based, and that is the humidity in the air, the amount of water that stays in your body versus what evaporates based on how dry it is, which is all about the temperature and the heat and the wind. So the windiness, how many molecules are in there that can take that vibration of heat. So up in the mountains, it's going to be very hot when the sun shines and very cold instantly when the sun goes behind the clouds. And then you take the issue of how much access to water you have um, around you, like through rain or through what you're drinking and whether it's rainwater or river water or pond water or ocean water. So ocean water is more salty, obviously. So as you're listening to this, you should be thinking, mm, sun, heat, that's agni, that's fire. Hmm, water, that's op or jala. Oh, she's talking about the altitude. That's the vayu. Uh, well, it's actually akash and vayu because it's the amount of um, air and the space in the air. And the wind, which we can say is the vayu. And so these are the elements. And you add to that the prithivi type and how it holds the water. And these things are absolutely measurable. They are observable. And they are the base of meteorology, of course, but also of ecology and many sciences in the biological systems, as well as any chemist knows that, you know, what a desiccator is and how they have to keep their chemicals in different ways in different environments. So if we know this in the modern sciences, and Ayurveda incorporates it seamlessly into the treatment of patients, why is it considered to be so foo-foo and not respected for its elegance and for its um, logical thinking? Mm. So when we say, yeah, so when we say that it's reductionistic and modern medicine thinks that Ayurveda just isn't scientific, you know, I really spent the article um, saying what is beyond chemistry? How can we live better and heal better beyond chemistry if we just refuse to uh, limit ourselves with biochemistry, nutrition, chemistry, dietetics, you know, and those kind of things and go beyond that and think about how molecules work on our uh, we'll say mind, body, senses, and spirit all together. Mm, absolutely. Thank you for that. And I think there's a, it's layered the reasons why modern science refuses to, to see this holistic systems based approach. However, in your article, you made a great point. You said, um, how we define medicine is a reflection of our spiritual vibrations. 
And I'd love to for you to discuss that further. Uh, you were talking about how for some people it's I have to see it to believe it. And yes. have to have the, you know, the lab reports and the double blind studies and so on. Can you uh, explain that a little bit more? How? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. And you and I were talking about this and, and kind of laughing that they do. I mean, it is true that you have to see it to believe it. At the same time, they don't see atoms and they don't see electricity. They don't see subatomic particles. And they certainly don't see everything that they claim. I mean, who has actually with their own eyes, seen the um, the molecule um, incretin or insulin, right? They've seen what insulin can do. They've seen what thyroid-stimulating hormone can do. But they're looking at pills that have millions of molecules in it, and they're trusting that that's what is there. They don't know that that is what is there necessarily. And so... Uh, and of course, we know that there have been many reports about how this particular drug was confiscated and then they tested it and found out that it didn't indeed have what it claimed to have. And there's been lots of that in modern medical pills. In fact, that's why pills were invented, because uh, back in the 1800s, the medicines were powders, you know, chemical powders, and they were put together by someone and we would trust that they were called compounders in a pharmacy. And we would trust that the compounder would put in the right proportion of the right thing as per the instructions of the physician. And if something adulterated into that packet that was handed to the patient, oh, no, something could happen. And so there were several cases of this happening where the compounder had put something together and maybe walked away before finishing because maybe they were making, you know, 20, 20 um, packets at a time. And something got in there and someone was poisoned or they forgot, and they added in extra. And so Henry Welcome came up with the concept of the pill where you take that powder and you pack it together using a binder and then you stamp it and say, this is a 75 milligram tablet of whatever. And the, he patented it. And that is why the Welcome Trust has so much money because it was a brilliant way to ensure that those powders would come together. Now, Ayurveda has been doing that for millennia, right? So it's not an accident that Welcome moved from the USA to England. And England, of course, had all kinds of uh, ways of getting information from India, whether it was by stealing or pillaging or whatever. And Henry Welcome actually did have a very wonderful hobby of collecting medical things from other countries, which he would either you know purchase or maybe coerce from people. But if you go and see his collection of what he learned... I don't think it's out of the blue that he invented the pill based on what we call guttikas or golis or vatikas, which are different shapes or sizes of powders called churna in Ayurveda that have been packed together, usually with something very benign like rice starch, which is sticky. Sometimes we'll use a herb that is sticky or we'll use gugulu, which is a resin. But that idea of having pills and having medicines that are available to us and we're trusting them come from the idea in modern medicine that molecules work. And if we can give people pure molecules, great. That is, um, you know, that is medicine. But these people that are trusting in it, they seem to think that only pure medicine is good and anything that comes in an herb where there are hundreds of compounds are bad. And that is something that the pharmaceutical industry has banked on. Meanwhile, if you come back to Ayurveda, when people are using herbal compounds, they find that, okay, yes, it's not a pure extract of curcumin. It's the entire uh, rhizome of turmeric. But when they take turmeric, they don't get upset stomach and they don't get the side effects of sudden heat or a rash or an unpredictable something that happens with curcumin, many people get this um, belching that they can't stop. And it's because the curcumin is a refined extract. Extract means it's only a part of the turmeric. So when I'm explaining this to my scientist friends, I say, okay, let's say your hand just picked up um, a fine instrument and did an amazing job uh, let's say it's a pipette and you use that. 
What if I now say, wow, I saw it. I saw him do it again and again with his hand and he used his right hand. So we cut off your right hand. We extract it from the rest of your body. And now we say that hand is now going to, you know, do that same function. Is it going to? And the scientist says, no. I said, why not? Because it needs to be connected to the whole in order to make its action apparent. I said, exactly. And that is why you can't take curcumin away from turmeric to get the action or lycopene away from the tomato or resveratrol away from the red wine. The whole thing needs to work together. And when I give it as an example of that, they get a little bit, um, you know, argumentative. And some have said to me, well, but my hand is empowered by me because I'm alive. I have a life force. Who cares about that in a turmeric plant? And, you know, I have to come back to him and say, you know, Ayurveda believes in the prana, the life force that exists within a a uh, plant and it's not that just because you unroot it from the ground that it loses its life force because for a plant some of the life force is the way that the structure stays in place and that structure is i mentioned earlier a quaternary structure that quaternary structure stays in place as long as that whole scaffolding is there and so the scaffolding of that rhizome that we call turmeric when you powder it, we think that it's become very fine, but it's huge. It's logarithmic scales. If you go from nanometers, a thousand nanometers makes a, a micrometer. And the micrometer, a thousand of those makes a millimeter. And if we have a powder that's one millimeter in um, size, in length, you know, it's so huge compared to that nanometer at which level the turmeric powder is acting on our body. And so a lot of people don't understand that when we're taking a powder, it's still in that platform, that matrix or, or kind of crystal structure of the turmeric is still what the body sees, even though for us, we've taken it from a let's say a centimeter down to a millimeter and or even a you know a like usually if you see a turmeric it's several inches long it's like three or four centimeters long so we're not thinking about how the chemistry actually is working we're just um i think a lot of people have just resigned it that the chemical laboratories know better and there's a lot of you know, there's a lot of business and, and yes. uh, economics and all that behind how the chemical companies grew. There are many books that people who want to read the history of medicine or the history of science can go and see. And um, there are more and more things popping up because now we have s some amount of open media. But mm -hmm. if you just go and watch a video on the top 10 families of the United States and the money that they have, we all know their names. Uh, more than half of them are involved with mining and the byproducts of mining that then went into chemistry and chemical um, either construction of things, chemical powders and various um, elements that were used for industrial or, you know, um, what can we say, like experiments at a chemical level to create new products some of them are industrial some of them are food some of them are homes some of them are you know and all over our world and then some of those companies made chemical products that were medicines and the way in which they convinced everyone that whole things are not good but cutting them down and bringing them to a purity which means one element or one thing we all believed it if we were from this kind of um, uneducated and I will say disconnected from our culture. If you're connected to your culture, you have seen things, you have witnessed things. Your mother has taught you yes. how to, whether it's cooking or gardening or washing your clothes, um, you've learned that. But if you are disconnected and your parents moved from some country, maybe it was war torn, maybe they were children, maybe they didn't learn anything. And you come to the great land of especially America, but also modern Europe. Those people watch advertising and they get their knowledge from 
those companies that are willing to give them information. So if you're convinced that the best cleaners in your house should be this bottle of, you know, this chemical that has this chlorine bleach in it, and that's what's going to be best for you, you're going to do it. You're going to use it. Your mom's going to use it and teach it to you. And then you're going to teach it to your kids. What happened to lemon juice? Mm. What happened to baking soda? What happened to using ash from, you know, things that have burned, so wood ash or charcoal ash. What happened to using old uh, rinds of those vegetables and fruits that we have finished with? And if we were using those for thousands of years, and it's only for the last hundred years that we've started using those bleaches, the chlorine bleach, what we call halogen bleaches, then can we not say that some of the decline of the health of the environment is due to us using those kind of things? I mean, how do we assume that they're, you know, th that's the pun that I put. There's a saying, better living through chemistry. And mm. the company that puts that slogan together and several companies that stand behind it are all saying that chemistry is the way forward. Ayurveda says, there is chemistry going on in your body, at your cellular level, at your subcellular level, in your DNA, which is a molecular level, or up at the level of your organs, or your whole body, or the way that you interact with your family, or with your community in your neighborhood. But all of those different chemistry, or um, you can say bonds between people, and between molecules, is part of a larger ecosystem. Mm -hmm. And that ecosystem is in balance because we're not isolating out parts of it. And we saw that during COVID, many people said, wait, let's go to this chapter, Charaka Vibhanasthan. It says, Janapada Dwamsa, look at the air around you, look at the water around you, clean that, clean the land around you, be aware of time, be careful with seeing what's going on, which you are sometimes not aware of because you're in your own world or you're playing video games or you're rushing off to work. Be aware of your environment. And mm -hmm. as people cleaned up their environment, you know, um, there was a lot less pestilence. I was here in India at the time, and I remember my friends in New York saying, oh, you know, uh, like in March 2020, they were saying, oh, you know, Indian people are just going to die. There's just going to be, a, oh, my God, it's such a populated country. And these people are just going to die. You know, they have bad hygiene. They don't know. They're uneducated. There's all this stuff. And when they saw that actually there were very few Indians in the rural areas that died, it was mostly in the three or four main big cities that were full of foreigners and full of people that live modern lifestyles. Oh, and I just thought that was very curious. Yeah, it was very yeah. curious that it was Delhi, Bombay, Pune, which is a very modern city where actually um, it's the largest vaccine headquarters in the entire world. And a lot of those people, because they make so much money, so much profit, live ultra modern lives. They live in, um, you know, air conditioning and they have just every modern convenience you can think of. Yeah. And if you looked at a place like Benares, where people choose, even if they have a lot of money, they choose to live very traditional lifestyles. You know, people, oh, COVID is happening. Okay, well, the cow is still going to give milk. So the mm -hmm. guy is going to come to my door and deliver the milk. And I want clean, fresh cow milk that's raw. I don't want to have to buy it in packets. I want my raw milk. And the vegetables are still going to grow. So I want the... The telawala, the guy with the hand cart, to still come outside. I'll go down once a day, even during lockdown, and go and get my vegetables and cook fresh and be in the house and enjoy. And the people in Benares, like nobody had COVID for the first year and a half. It was only after the vaccines came out that people wow. got COVID. Yeah. And so I watched this as a scientist, as a clinician. I was watching and I was working too, but I was watching what happened. And I found it really curious that the ones that got sick were the ones that were having the reductionistic approach. Mm. And the ones that stayed well drank clean water. They boiled their water. People put out water for the birds because you have to, you know, um, look at the ecosystem. So the birds uh, are part of that. And little animals, so they were not throwing their scrapings in the trash. They were putting it into like a compost pile and then putting it out on the street 
in, you know, under the tree where the roaming street dogs and cows could come and get their food. We don't want them to die because they're part of our ecosystem. Exactly. And um, people were also, you know, they were using um, the the onion skins and the peels of their uh, aromatic vegetables and burning them twice a day, once at sun, sunrise in the morning and at sunset at night. And that dhupam, that smoke that comes from that, was an air purifier. Mm. And obviously that was important during those two years. And people still do it today. So yeah. that reductionistic approach that we're talking about, um, you know, when when we started this this part of it, we were talking about the spiritual vibration. If your spiritual vibration says all of this is hocus pocus, there is nothing scientific about it, then of course you're not going to believe in it. And of course you're not going to accept it. And you're going to say that's not physically or evidence verifiable. But you're not even paying attention to the evidence and you're willing to believe, not you, but a person is willing to believe in something that they think is verifiable because a whole bunch of other people said it's verifiable. Right. I would conjecture to ask some of these really smart scientists whether or not they actually understand what a cell culture study is or what a rat study is or what a, a docking study is or what some of these double blind placebo controlled drug studies are and whether or not we are um, actually creating evidence. So I'm just going to move into a slightly different topic, which is about the big sized evidence, big data. If you've, if you've heard that term, mm -hmm. big data refers to large scale studies that are supposed to tell us much more about people because it takes into account and averages out all the little, little changes between people. But I've talked to many big data scientists, huge, you know, hundreds of thousands of people kind of studies. And most of them will say, you know, we end up losing anything that's valuable when we do big data studies because humans are healed by small things that need to be tweaked in their system. So the example that many will give is that if you want to find the right medicine for a population, right? Everyone says, oh, well, we want a double-blinded study, placebo control. Tell me how you would find out what the right shoe size is for all people. You know, if you use American shoe size, you can say, oh, well, the average is like a seven or an eight in a woman or a nine or a 10 for a guy. But the guy that has a size five foot is going to really suffer wearing size nine shoes. And the guy with size 12 foot is going to not even fit into the size nine shoes, right? So when you have averages, which is what modern medical statistics uses, the statistics only apply to the very few people that are right around that particular part of the curve. And if anyone really understands statistics, I have taken more statistics classes than I have liked. <laughs> and when I look at it, I always look at this bell curve, this what they call the Bayesian model. And I look at this bell curve and I say, right, but why does this apply to everyone? Mm -hmm. I mean, if you just look at someone that got into medical school, they're like 1% or less of the entire population, right? So if you're going to make that 1%, which doesn't even come close to the average, follow the same rules as everyone that does the average, how does that work? How does that work for that person? That person isn't part of the average. They don't vibrate in that way. So big data don't seem to work. And most of the modern medical scientists who really get it are starting to speak out on it. Yeah. Then when actually, you go from big data. Yeah. Sorry. Go ahead. No, no. I was just listening to a podcast on that this week of a modern med medical doctor, well known. And he did a podcast episode on how, you know, science isn't absolute or isn't perfect. There can be personal bias. There is a lot of suppression of science due to personal bias. And they were talking about in relation to the misunderstanding of, uh, about fat and the root cause of heart disease. But there can be a lot of influence, right? And, and I said that. Like, 
it's layered as to why people refuse to look at the data and see the data of holistic systems-based approach to medicine, because not only personal bias, but business opportunities, profits, uh, ego can come into this as well, right? That's right. And one of the hobbies of American education is to set people against each other in competition. And I've heard so many times that competition is healthy. So if you look at the competition of the people that invented insulin, there's a team of two guys and then there were two others who were part of it and they sold it um, and they made a beautiful compound. They saved this guy's life who had diabetes and needed his insulin. He was a type one diabetic. And so insulin became all the rage and, you know, rightly so it saved some lives. But there was another guy named DeFrance who was looking at glucagon. Glucagon and insulin work um, side by side and they have feedback loops with each other. And I coming into, you know, medicine, I asked, well, if we look at insulin, why don't we look at glucagon the same way? It's also a chemical. Why don't we find ways to make glucagon available the way we made insulin available? Why isn't the glucagon guy getting any attention? So I started reading more about him and he was publishing, but it was really obvious that there was an entire fraternity um, pitted against him because he was trying to bring out that there was something else important, you know, for, for the equation than just insulin. Same thing with the cholesterol and heart attack and heart disease um, thing. So there are a lot of people that showed that if you look at people that got heart attacks, some of them had low cholesterol and some of them had high cholesterol. And if you look at the people that had high cholesterol and you lower their cholesterol using specific drugs, and there were early on many, many drugs, and then statins came, turns out that the yeast that grows on red rice is probably the most powerful yeast um, stat, uh, it actually makes the statin. So it's probably the most natural form of this cholesterol lowering you can have, but they refined it and they sold it and they did their studies. I was actually part of, um, that whole, uh, thing. So I know a lot about HMG CoA reductase inhibitors, which is what they're called. And, uh, the lowering of the cholesterol in this huge number of people actually did not lead to real lowering of heart attacks. And I stopped and I said, well, wait a second. I thought that cholesterol was what caused heart disease. So if you lower the cholesterol, you should get less heart disease and that's not happening. And they would say, oh yeah, well, you know, um, there are other factors too. So, okay, there are other factors, but even when they isolated it out and matched people very carefully for age and gender and lifestyle and all, they still found that lowering the cholesterol doesn't really do that much to lower the risk of heart attacks. And then the question was, well, then why are we taking it? And they started noticing, so this is back in the 70s and 80s when this was happening, they started noticing by the 90s, 2000s, that people were having memory problems. People were having injuries. Why? Because when you lower the cholesterol in a body and the number one, um, you can say, building block for a huge number of the cell wall, the cell membranes, right? The boundaries of the cell, as well as there's a whole group of chemicals called the eicosanoids, and they are, include cyclooxygenase and um, I, prostaglandins. I don't know how many of you have heard of throm, uh, thromboxanes and leukotrienes, and all of these are inflammation chemicals. They are all released when a cell gets cut open, and they are all sister molecules of that cholesterol, and they are needed in abundance in every cell of the body, but especially in the cells that are lining cells that we would call kapha cells. And the kapha part of the body was getting injured, so the brain was losing its balance of these cholesterol-derived fats that the uh, Schwann cells and these lubrication insulation cells of the brain, the neurons that they require. And the cholesterol was being artificially lowered, not for a day or a week or a month or a year, but for decades. And these people were getting Alzheimer's. And 
they found associations. And I thought it was interesting that these big journals would publish it, but no one would do that press conference. Like I was telling you earlier, <laughs> no one would go out there and say, Hey, everyone, you need to know and know, learn about this. Right. So we did get a few of these reports. Doctors did talk about it. I would raise my hand at CME meetings and say, you know, what about this? These are data. This is evidence. What do you think? And they would look at me like I was declaring the emperor with no clothes and therefore I should be shot, you know, for, mm. for, for revealing that, for being a troublemaker. Um, I watched the same thing if I talked about angioplasty and how absolutely angioplasty is not associated with any good outcome. Mm. In fact, the, it accelerates the person's need to get a second angioplasty and to have heart, uh, heart, um, Incidents. It can be a heart attack. It can be a stroke. It can be so many things. And I asked, well, if angioplasty doesn't show any real benefit, then why do you do it? It shows a benefit to the doctor that does it because they get paid handsomely. But then we come back to the commerce conversation. And I didn't like that commerce conversation because I just felt like it's too, uh, it hurts my, you know, it hurts my soul to think about the fact that medicine is only there for people who are smart enough to know how to, um, get beyond the people that are trying, you know, vultures that are trying to bring them in for, for yeah. easy money. Yeah. And in places where you have national health insurance, they're saying, Oh, you know, we don't have to worry about paying for it. Right. But what you get is the modern medical system mm-hmm. that churns you through and tells you what they're going to give you. And it costs the state money, but the patients don't get those solutions that they need. Mm-hmm. And when you come back to Ayurveda, Ayurveda says, listen, we, you know, and we don't know what they had 10,000 years ago. They might have had double blind placebo controlled trials and they just said, these don't work. And then they let them go. And they said, look, what we'd rather use is a series of well trained doctors who say, if you give this, then this happens. And I'll just share a couple of what are evidences uh, in mo- in modern Ayurveda. So in ancient Ayurveda, they say that you should start the day with a food that's brahmana, that builds up your body tissues. And then you should eat uh, a certain amount in the middle of the day. So that's your main meal. And then you should have a very light dinner. So what should you start off your day? Not a full meal, but just to break fast. You should have something to drink. It can be a tea. It can be some water. It can be milk. It just depends on what your doshas and dhatus and your desha and dusham and balam and kalam, all that are telling you. But the four items that are brahmana are pure rice that has been unpolished, unadulterated, not rice product, not cream of rice, not just rice, locally grown rice. Rice that drank the same water that you drink and breathed the same air that you breathe when it was growing in the ground. And rice is grown in most parts of the world or wheat. So in most parts of the world, except the Arctic and a few other places, you will find some rice or some wheat. And that wheat is not enriched wheat. It is the actual whole wheat with the germ, with the hull. That is then threshed and made into whole wheat uh, berries that are then crushed into whole wheat flour without any part removed. That is great for the body. And many people grew up on wheat. They had bread or they had rotis or they had some kind of cream of those wheat berries. Um, There's upma. There's so many preparations all around the world that are... um, from whole wheat. And if you go to places, certainly in France, out in the country, they will get the wheat and they will thresh it themselves. And they really don't want to go to a bakery that has enriched flour. They'll say, this is not fresh baked bread. Mm -hmm. And they will ask, can I see the flour? Is the flour uh, separated? You know, they have different words in different places for, hey, did you separate it? Separate means you took the germ out and you made it into enriched white flour. Mm. So it was white flour, then you enriched it with vitamin B because white flour without it actually causes beriberi. It's, it's been shown in, uh, in the 1930s. So because of that, it's forbidden to sell flour without the germ because the germ has all the B vitamins and it creates some kind of deficiency that 
absolutely affects the heart very quickly. So you have to add that back in, but it's inconvenient because it's very sticky. So what they did is they just um, added in artificial laboratory made vitamin B and they found that it gave them some effect. But in France, they're very picky about it. And in, uh, in Benares, they're very picky about it. They will go and they know their guy who's the farmer who will just bring them wheat berries and then there's something called a pesha wala. Pesha means to crush or to pulverize. They'll go to him. They'll give him their, um, you know, 10 kilos of wheat berries and the guy will crush it for them. And then they bring it home and they have their fresh wheat flour. They keep it in a, you know, a, a bug proof container and then they make fresh bread every day. And they won't buy a loaf of bread. I mean, to them, loaf of bread is poison. So of the four things, one is pure rice, one is pure wheat, one is pure cow milk that's raw and slowly boiled, and one is ghee from cow milk. And if you start your day with those or any of the combinations of those, you will have brahmana. What does that mean? That means your tissues get strong, they get fortified to resist any kind of disease they're going to say see as you walk through your day. And in the middle of the day, you should have all those things that are harder to digest, that are cravings that you really want to have, that are uh, the kinds of foods that um, aren't necessarily so good for you, but that you really want to have, and combinations that you want to have, as well as your grains, legumes, nuts, seeds, vegetables, mm -hmm. uh, something slightly sweet, something dairy Something fermented, whether it's an achar pickle or whether it's sauerkraut or whether it's kimchi or whether it's dahi, which is yogurt, uh, curds, or whether it's something fermented. And that fermented uh, food helps preserve the real estate in your intestines that is kept by these wonderful organisms that you have cultivated since you were a kid. And so people make this part of their diet. So who knows whether genetics and epigenetics is really about the diets that we intake due to our parents feeding us that way for the first 10 years or 20 years of our life. How are you going to compare those? Well, Ayurvedic doctors looked at those foods, those four Brahmana foods, and they looked at people, they ate other things, and they saw that different um, constitutions, different strengths, different tall, short, black, white, heavy, thin People who ate those four Brahmana foods had more strength in their body. Overall, they had more ojas. They just started their day. They were able to do the work they needed. They had better moods. They just lived better. And then they put that into a book. And so you see the recommendations only that these scientists went back and forth with each other and said, no, I don't think we should include this because I had a couple of patients that had this, this, this happen and that didn't work or that didn't work. And so that's why you don't see the recommendations in Ayurveda that say everyone should wake up in the morning and have, you know, three liters of water. There's nothing written like that. Why? Because someone found it was helpful and another scientist doctor said, you know, my guy drank it and he didn't do well. He right. was kind of sick and his digestive fire was all mucky. And so they had to think about it. I said, all right, it's not going in the book for everyone. So what we'll do is we'll just say you should drink clean water, but we won't say you should start out the day and drink, you know, hot water, cold water, lemon water, whatever water, right? We won't exactly. say that. Yeah. We'll just say when you drink water, eat clean water. So their recommendations are pools of data, of evidence from hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of doctors, plus their own students who observed and came back to the teacher and said, teacher, I tried this. It was an accident. But guess what I noticed? This happened. And so when I look in the texts and I see certain foods and I can assure that what I'm eating is the same food that they're saying, right? So, you know, yava is barley, but what kind of barley? There's like four different kinds of barley, right? So, or in the in America there are. I mean, I don't know around the world how many kinds there are, but yava barley is the one that is very, very, very good for reducing uh, pitta and vata and really grounding the body very well. And so if you're looking at someone that needs a particular solution, all these foods have been worked out. 
routines have been worked out. And then we didn't even touch on the different medicines that have been worked out. So those medicines have been found to have certain doshic changes. And it will warn you, you know, if there's too much of this kind of uh, desham or this season or this uh, age of the patient, um, alter it this way. That's why when they say we need to have standard operating procedures for making a particular drug, I say, but that drug needs to be altered for the patient. How can mm-hmm. you stand, even Trifola, you know, you can buy Trifola, but it's not for everyone. There are people that need things much stronger than Trifola. Like maybe they need, you know, three times the Haritaki, or they might need um, Cassia Fistula to help them, or they might need Kutaj to, to help them. There are four different kinds of constipation that Ayurveda talks about, and they talk about different herbs for each one. How are you going to randomize, double blind, and placebo control that, you know, if you have all these different factors of uh, the reasons behind the person getting constipation? But if you have an Ayurvedic doctor, if you or I talk to the patient, right, then we'll be able to piece out exactly what's going on for them. I call them my A, B, C, D, E, F, right, the appetite, bowel movement, cravings, their sleep pattern of drowsiness, their emotions and their fatigue. And through that, I can figure out what their agni is, what their bala is, and then I can give them the right drug and a a prescription for food, a prescription for um, lifestyle things to avoid um, or to do. And that beats big data. Exactly, because this is evidence-based over observed over thousands of years, which still stands the test of time. And the principles are yes, observed. Exactly. You know, rather than principles changing every 10 years with a new article in a journal, mm-hmm. Ayurveda has been trying to share that there are other ways that things happen if you just shift the way that you're willing to look at what is quote unquote evidence, look at what is quote unquote medicine, and understand that food and lifestyle and sound and Attitude are just as powerful medicines as that physical chemical, you know, pill that you're taking. Absolutely. As you said in the article, everything in our lives is medicine as it shifts our cellular functions. So we can use everything in our lives. And I think this is the way forward. The more awareness there is of Ayurveda and people understanding that there are other ways of healing and more natural ways of healing. And as you said as well, like until modern science integrates the role of prana, all their calculations of medicine will lead them short of true solutions, Mm -hmm. right? So So until there's an integration of nature and that vital energy force. Yeah. And until they understand what nature is, I mean, they can study biology all they want. But if they're not willing to observe the amazing patterns of nature, which is what vata is, right? The pattern of yeah. movement, which is what yeah. pitta is, the patterns of transformation, the kapha, the patterns of lubrication and stickiness. And, you know, over sticky is called kleda and under sticky is low kapha. But to understand that kapha is necessary for stability and lubrication, these are just, these are like from the planetary level down to the nanoparticle level. Mm. And if we want to see them, if we want to believe that this is the pattern, we have to let go of this very, you know, ingrained thing that says you can do whatever you want and be separate from nature. It's not going to affect you. You can eat what you want. You don't have to be part of the ecosystem. Just use this molecule to counter that molecule. And you don't have to be part of this wave or pattern that is living on the earth. And people have been trying to do this for 50 years, you know, living in air conditioned uh, rooms that are comfortable, but not realizing that the air condition that keeps you at one temperature destroys your body. Your body needs that hot where it makes it sweat and that cold that makes it contract. And the definition of uh, ushna, which we call hot, is not hot. It's heating that which makes one sweat. Mm -hmm. That which heats up the molecules so much that they sweat out, they change the turgidity of the cell until it opens up and lets the molecules out. That is what ushna means. It means to make sweat. And shita does not mean cold. It means cooling to the point where there's contraction. And that 
opening and closing, that opening the boundaries and then closing them and contracting and then opening them again and sweating and letting out water and then closing them again. That cycle can be day, night, day, night. It can be winter, summer, winter, summer, but it's crucial for the backdrop of what we can call, um, you know, the loop of rebuilding and unbuilding and Mm -hmm. keeping in balance. Mm -hmm. And if you stay in air conditioning, if you do the same thing every day, you know, you might say, oh, I'm consistent, but you can't do everything the same every day because the seasons are changing you. In the summer, you have to take off that, you know, that very thick sweater and mittens and socks and a hat. You have to because it's too hot. And in the winter, you can't wear that tank top and shorts and a bikini. You have to put on heavier clothes. Just as those things are necessitated by the weather, so should your your exercise change and your foods change and the way you do activities, the places that you go, the way you drink your water, all of that has to change. And if that can't be part of creating evidence, then we are not, never going to really understand the science of being, yes. right? Dr. Boswati, such great information. And I do think, you know, obviously modern, modern medicine is beginning to understand the effect of lifestyle and, and nature and so on. And we see it with functional medicine. Uh, we see functional mm-hmm. medicine now, this new branch of medicine bringing in these concepts from Ayurveda, these, you know, living in tune with the circadian rhythms. It is going in that direction. It's great to see that. So I think we're kind of taking down this big structure of old way of thinking and now moving into a more holistic systems-based approach of medicine. It's the old guard is not going to leave easily, but we are seeing some positive movement, as I say, with um, Mm. with functional medicine. And I think functional medicine is biochemistry language uh, of many of the concepts of Ayurveda. Mm-hmm. And I if agree. they can learn some Dhinacharya, Ritucharya, and understand those wider patterns. You know, I I know Jeffrey Bland very well and worked with him for years. And when he invented the entire topic of functional medicine, I used to, you know, go and sit with him and, and we'd hang out at conferences. and talk. And Jeff is a brilliant guy. And I would say to him, Jeff, can I teach you about the concept of dhatus and dhatu poshak, which is the way that tissues are made according to Ayurveda? Because it's so different than the histology that you understand. It's so different than the way that your chemicals that you're creating are working on the histology. And um, he's like, give me an example. And I said, well, like brown fat and white fat, which was just being discovered back, you know, when I was talking to him. I said, Ayurveda understands that from the muscle, you have these precursors that make fat. And from the fat, you have these precursors that make bone. So we talk about rasa, rakta, mamsa, meda, asti, and that that line of, and he's like, what are you talking about? That's not true. These are separate connective tissues. The muscle is a totally separate kind of tissue than fat is. And that is what he had been taught. That is what people had been taught. And as new science has emerged and shown that there are actually really great connections between bone and uh, nervous system tissue, that one begets the other, that there is a kind of muscle, um, uh, we'll call it the um, fat precursor that actually is a kind of muscle. There are these stem cells that are showing that they move from one to the other. And when I read these papers, I'm stunned at how they are prescient, how Ayurvedic um, doctors understood that this will turn into that. And I just wonder, like, how did they, how did they meditate this? How did they find the evidence for this? And So there's a lot of stuff in functional medicine that is useful, but there's a lot of stuff that falls back on modern medical paradigms and they are still vibrating at that rate. And so some of the molecules that they create as medicines 
for the biochemical pathways that they create are still not looking at the fractals. They're still not looking at wider patterns. They think a biochemical pathway is going to work a certain way because they did a rat culture study that showed that if you add this chemical, then up the other side of it, you get this other chemical. So you add in melatonin, you get more serotonin made, and that's it. And what they don't understand is that melatonin is there as a chemical, but what provoked the melatonin goes out fanning in 10 different directions and each intersection affects 10 different things so that you get this holistic cascade. It's not just a linear, you know, A to B, B to C, C to D. It's A goes to B, C, D, E, F, G, H. Mm -hmm. And then each Mm -hmm. one of those goes to uh, many, many things. And functional medicine doesn't account for that, which is why sometimes you get an effect And sometimes you end up spending a lot of money for a lot of very expensive supplements and you are kind of feeling a little better, you think, but you're still basically sick. And I've seen it again and again in functional medicine patients. I've also seen people dole out $5,000, $10,000 to go to some of these doctors and they are not better in six months. Mm. And they come to Ayurveda and they get Musta and Bilwa and a third and fourth medicine that is tailored to their particular Dushim, Desham, Balam, Kalam. And the fourth medicine is tailored to the state of their liver and how they need to clean out. They take it for six weeks and they are better. Yeah. And I've done it and many doctors have done it. And so my question is, why would you go and spend $10,000 and no results in six months when you can spend you know, a couple hundred dollars if that yeah, and learn and, practices and get, that will empower you to to take charge of your own health. So it doesn't reoccur, right. and it's it's and that's the it beauty doesn't reoccur. Ayurveda, it's it's empowering right. the individual. That's um, right, Doctor Baswati. Such a great conversation. I could continue chatting with you for hours, but we need to park it here so you can get on with your day as well. Um, but before we finish up, Dr. Boswati, if there's any final thoughts, and I'd love for you to tell people where they can find out more about you, your Dinacharya Institute, and anything else you want to share, please. Well, if people want to join the classes that we have, uh, we have the archives as well, where we start from the very beginning and move forward. These classes are called master classes because they're not for beginners. I love when people take the master classes and learn deeper and deeper how to connect what they've already learned in their trainings with the actual authentic Shastras. And we've picked teachers that are really clear and very good at understanding real Ayurveda. If they want to take Ayurveda from the very beginning and learn it, I do a class every year, usually twice a year, that is an introduction to Ayurveda. So we just finished one in January 2023. We'll have another one soon. And if they want to read, then, of course, you mentioned Everyday Ayurveda. My second book will be coming out sometime in the next several, maybe six months. And I am kind of available and kind of not available because I'm traveling a lot. And working on several projects, including my farm, which you mentioned at the beginning, Veda Farms is doing not just growing of medicinal plants, but we're going to be doing research on how those work in the human bodies. We're very excited about that. It's amazing everything you're doing and and how much energy you have and what you're putting out into the world. And and thank you for taking the time to chat with us today, Dr. Baswati. I really appreciate it. And please come back and visit us again soon. Great. Thank you so much, Colette. My pleasure. And just to let the listeners know that I will put the links in the show notes so you can get over to Dr. Baswati's website. Thanks again, Dr. Baswati. Take good care of yourself. Be well. Bye. I hope you enjoyed that conversation with Dr. Baswati and please check out the show notes for all the links mentioned in this episode. If you would like some support on your Ayurvedic journey, check out my online services where I offer consultations, at-home cleanse tailored to you and educational programs. You can find that link in the show notes or visit my website, elementshealingandwellbeing.com. You can also follow me on social media under Elements Healing and Wellbeing on Facebook. And my new Instagram page is Elements of Ayurveda Podcast. Thank you so much for tuning in. And until next time, take good care of yourself, be well, and bye for now. Slongerful. Full.